Welcome to our new episode of Speak Revenue. Remember, revenue is not a goal, it's a result. But a result of what? In this show, we turn our eyes from the output towards the inputs. We speak to sales leaders and entrepreneurs about their journeys. Join us on our quest to uncover and learn the root causes of success. Let us unpack what works for them and what didn't. Today, with our guest, David Kirkdorfer. Hello, everyone. David. Hello, Thomas. Thanks. Great to have you here. Thanks for taking your time. Awesome. So let's get started right away. First, quick question. Let, let us know. Who are you? What, what sure. are you? So, um, it's a pleasure to be for? here. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is David Kirkdorfer. I am a B2B technology marketer for the last 25 or so years. Uh, I've been a VP of marketing three times, a director or a senior director of demand generation five times. I've seen four acquisitions and one IPO. Um, over the last several years, I've become a fractional uh, marketing leader or a fractional CMO, depending a little bit, and work with a mix of startups and scale-ups and some larger organizations too. I think the thing that I do when I enter these organizations is I become somewhat connective tissue between the product team, the sales team, other parts of marketing that may exist, and the customer base or the prospect base, building programs and systems uh, to build more sales opportunities, essentially. What else? I play guitar. You can't see it here, but I'll bring it on camera. Here we go. <laughs> play guitar. Used to play in rock bands. Used to play up and down the East Coast of the United States, making a big noise. That was fun. <laughs> so, And I, I live here in, in Boston, where today it's very warm. Great. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. So looks like on when it comes to marketing, you've seen everything and know all the problems and works well, what works well and maybe it doesn't work well. Maybe uh, just a, a big picture. What uh, the your current goal? Maybe when we f focus on a specific use case for this year sure. and for next year. Is there well, a good example? The eternal problem for the customers that I work with, the areas that I'm involved with, is demand generation, demand creation, lead generation. People have different words for these same, same basic idea. Helping build a pipeline for sales reps. Um, a lot of the customers that I have have direct, have sales reps. So my customers have a, a motion where there is, um, if you will, leads are generated, inquiries are generated. They are passed through to an, in, uh, an internal sales development rep or two or three, depending on the size of the organization, who do some kind of outreach and qualification. And then the uh, better situations are, are brought forward to sales reps or account managers, depending. That's the broadly speaking. Uh, most of my customers have that kind of motion. There are challenges within that style of, of, of demand generation and conversion. And it's not what I would necessarily recommend to everyone, but this is often the, the situation that I'm working within. The things that are on my mind when I'm doing demand generation, of course, is to, is to do it at a, a price point that we can afford, I'm focused on the people who make the biggest difference and trying to build um, in the demand generation a, a brand um, impression I'd say that 80% of anyone's interactions with a company begin with the demand generation activity. So the quality of the demand generation activity measured on many different kind of ways becomes the quality of the brand. So if, if the quality of the demand generation feels as if it's bothering you, pestering you, bugging you, that's not going to feel good on your brand right? Hmm. Just as a, a, a simple example. So demand generation is, is clearly kind of key. So I can, I can dive in deeper on, on different considerations if you'd like to jump in, but I, I want to make sure you, yeah. yeah maybe can, we can dive into that already when it comes to demand generation. A lot is happening in, in this field is always probably continuously, but especially during the last few years, things that have worked uh, maybe three years ago are uh, rather not successful at, at these times uh, after different crises and different styles of working with a lot of home office and different um, input factors for that. So w what do you think are the main changes or, and how So the big challenge 
today is that the go-to-market that I just mentioned, where it is reached by sales development reps or business development reps going to AEs, is working less well than it ever has. Before COVID, it was already starting to not work so well. And then COVID came along and just accelerated the trend in it not working so well. We became overwhelmed. As, as individuals sitting at our desks, our email boxes blew up with emails. All of a sudden, companies in the tech space that were trying to reach their customers could not go to trade shows. And sales reps are going like, well, we have to take our fate into our own hands and tools like outreach and various other types of sales enablement tools, which gave to salespeople the ability of doing campaigns, essentially, just like marketing. So marketing campaigns, you'd, marketing used to send emails from HubSpot or you know Marketo or various different systems. There are many. And sales were like, huh, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And so along comes outreach and provides much of the same functionality as far as, as, far as the sales rep is concerned. So all of a sudden they had a tool so they could send out a lot of email. And that, you know, whenever anything becomes very popular, <laughs> um, it becomes abused. And then everyone, it starts to fail. It's, yeah. Let me let me step back. I've been doing marketing, as I say, for a long time for technology okay. companies. Yep. Things changed in 2006, specifically. And I would suggest that the, big, the thing that changed is that's when Google Analytics became generally available. I think it was 2006 or 2009. I'm, I always make, get my sixes mm. and nines mixed up. What would Jimi Hendrix think? So... <laughs> That offered an ability to, we thought, track what was making a difference, provide attribution, because we wanted to know if our money is being well spent. And from that point forward, electronic attribution has become very popular because we tend to think of it as being infallible. We tend to think of it as being the truth, accurate. It's digital. It's either yes or no, right? On, off, digital. What? Yeah, right? right. And, and so Easy. if you're trying to say to someone, well, if I'm spending money, if I've got an extra $10,000 to my marketing promotion budget, where would I put it? Well, you would want to put it where it's making a difference. And we're receiving signals back from electronic attribution that seems to indicate this is what's working best and this is not working so well and so forth. What people have started to realize is electronic attribution is good at what it does, but what it does is it picks up where the prospect is being captured, not where the prospect is first coming into contact with who you are, what you do and why you might be interesting. So, for example, yeah, you might right. yeah. take a look at David Kirkdorfer. Think of me as a company. Perhaps after listening to this podcast, you say, hmm, that David guy, he was kind of interesting, right? Maybe. And imagine I had a website and you went to my website. My SEO, you were probably going like, I'm not sure. How do you spell his last name again? I just heard it said. So you type a Google query to try and figure out what's David Kirkdorfer's URL. Now, we have a lot of b2b company tech companies that have got very creative names and so we're often typing I, I don't know how to spell their name url let me see if i can find them so i do a query i click on a link that i see oh that's the guy yep oh that's the company and then you go to the website my electronic attribution would say the way you came to me was because of seo but actually really the way you came to me because you heard this podcast. So the idea was created right. in the podcast, but captured in the SEO. And so now we recognize that distinction, which is an important distinction. We can say, okay, well, we can use the electronic attribution for what it's good at, where are things being captured? But it's not necessarily mm -hmm. telling us where things are being right. created. And so that's an interesting point I just want to kind of highlight because it influences a lot mm -hmm of our marketing. Why? Well, we're still budgeting to do things, but 
if we are, and, they, and what I'm describing here is essentially I'm revealing this notion of dark social. There isn't a link that you can press on while you're listening to this podcast in the podcast to a word that I say. But you, you hear this podcast, or maybe it's a reference in a, in a Slack community or another community, or maybe you went to a trade show and bumped into someone while you were in line to register and you were talking about your situation and they said, gosh, you should really check out this company. And so you heard about something there and then you do the Google query kind of thing that I just described. The, the, the main point here I'm trying to get at is our budgeting is affected by our attribution, but if our attribution is lopsided, unbalanced, and only picking up where we capture, we're not doing the full marketing that we should be doing or could be doing. And so this implies, this has implications to your budget, to your headcount, to your, to your workflow, um, just to recognize this difference. So I just wanted to kind of bring that into the conversation quickly. Yeah, that's right. It's very important. So regarding demand generation and the first contact with any person or potential client, if you don't know where, where the first contact happened, it's really hard to uh, create a go-to-market go to strategy. Well, so How do I, I start that? by trying to work with my clients to really nail down what an ideal customer profile is. We always have limited budget mm -hmm. and I can't boil the ocean as the expression goes, right? So I want to make sure that I'm yeah. I'm focused on really who is the ideal customer profile. And sometimes it happens that when you write it down and put it in front of people, this is what you said, right? This is what you wanted it to be. These are the firmographics. These are some of the information, different information about who you would like <coughs> and you share it. People didn't know that it, or they might not agree. So it's really important to get both sales and marketing um, and senior management, ELT focused, are we clear that this is our, our ideal customer profile? And what is ideal customer profile? Mm. So there is TAM, total addressable market, SAM, SAM service addressable market, and, and SOM, service obtainable market. And then I, after that, put ICP, ideal customer profile. So I wanted to make those distinguish just th those terms distinguished as well. So step one is let's make sure we agree on what is our ideal customer profile, because that's what everything's going to focus on now. Um, within the ideal customer profile, which I think of as a type of company I want to work with, I then also want to know and define who are the personas that we believe are part of the buying process for this solution. Okay. There are, um, we, we, and, and there are so many sales systems and, and, and books written about this. And it's not as if any of them are really wrong. Yeah. It's trying to find the thing that works for you. So what we do know is that buying groups, the more expensive the product, the more the product has a business impact that touches many people, the more people are involved in the buying process, which is natural. So we want to identify who are the constituents of a buying group may not always be present in every purchase, but generally we see these people. What do they care about? And so I try to do a jobs to be done style of persona. So I'm not so interested about yeah. David has a awesome. dog and he likes to go to the movies or something like this. I want to know, here's his job title. Here's what success right. looks like. Here's his struggles. Here's, here's the things that he wish he could do. Here's what he likes as far as um, working with good tech. What is a good tech look to him look like to him and so forth. So I'll just stop there because I, I want to let you kind of jump in on the question if you have some. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's great. Thank you for, for those insights and for, for your explanation. But do you see uh, when it comes to misunderstanding of, of ICP, do, do you see different patterns? Is it um, significantly different from with startups compared to series A or series B companies, or is it throughout the stages, maybe the same misunderstanding? Every company ICP. is a little different based or on the same people degree in my, in my field. Same Every company. So the, where sure. it gets, companies go through different phases of growth. The first phase founder led sales, if you will, maybe yeah. <clears throat> anything to keep the lights on. Your ICP might be a little wide, okay? You might say, yeah, great, <laughs> excellent. Yeah. You know, I'll, thank you for your business. And we're here to serve you and make you successful. And over time, you might say, okay, but I really prefer to focus on this. 
perhaps in this in that sales process in that product design phase you start to realize this is actually where we're making the most impact with these types of customers and if we make impact with these types of customers then that makes it easier for us to have a value conversation you may say pragmatically speaking we're going to focus on smaller enterprises because we could never support a big one their x department is bigger than our entire company <laughs> so they could kill us just trying to keep them happy and and all of a sudden we're off base so every company stage might do just something different um back to your back to your initial question so if you're in a growth phase just in that first get the first 5 million your icp may not be as tight as you would wish it because you're being a little opportunistic and you may have at that point what i i call sales reps who are trailblazers trailblazing sales reps are very valuable for a startup they take the raw capabilities of your solution and they're very good at finding ways that the capabilities can be combined and spoken about they're like you know rock stars in in my world if you will right and marketing people generally don't like them because these trailblazing sales reps go off and do their own thing a little bit which is important to be able to have happen in an early stage later on lots of trailblazing sales reps and it's a complete mess so you just have to recognize different exactly yeah, so you need some standard if you if you understand what phase you're in you say okay I'm a marketing guy in a startup environment where we have some trailblazing sales reps who are making 80% of our sales and they're not following the method I'm here to support their success because their success keeps us in business as you get bigger as you have more repeat situations where you've sold you can establish a tighter icp and then what often happens is you say we think we've maxed out with this icp maybe we should change our icp and often times what will happen is the companies that focus on the small and medium sized businesses want to go up market and then their product market fit may not be so strong as they go to a different icp and that's an interesting problem yeah. um that many companies don't recognize as they do that transition they think it's going to work and then they mm -hmm. discover it's mm -hmm. much harder or more complicated big companies tend to go down market they take their big big company success and they say well we've saturated our fortune 5000 let's see if we can go down market and you see that happen and again the same problem with product market fit it doesn't quite you know feel right it's it's selling is is more complicated than um initially thought so anyway I'll, i'll stop there yes yeah that's really interesting yeah it's i i'm just asking because i've seen uh, really established companies as well who weren't really aware of the icp and have already grown but at some point of time it seems like it's just a mess and you're growing inefficiencies as you're trying to scale and you uh, think you're or assume you're able to scale but it produces more more and more mess um, that that that's some impressions i got from some examples it looks like you've got a very standardized or a process oriented view and and style of work maybe uh, could you please step me through a, a, a sales or a marketing process in in your case like a a current one um, okay sure so can... imagine i'm starting in, uh, with a new client I might have some familiarity yeah. with the market maybe maybe not but I don't want to take my assumptions to be the truth so what often is very valuable and important if I'm able to do it is to be able to speak with actual customers what do they like what do they not like why did they decide I'm trying to learn from the customers outside in perspective where they're finding impact where the promise has been made and kept why they decided to do this what it took for them to be successful surprises i'm trying to learn from the customer so i can catch up with maybe the rest of the company who has over a period of months or years gathered in you know all the conversations they've had over the water cooler at the bar in slack messages all those types of things so i need to kind of catch up and the best way is to speak to the customer as much as i can quickly often I, when i'm brought in it's it's with a demand generation kind of focus they may have a particular motion that they like to run so sometimes i'm running that motion for them one of the things that i try to introduce to my clients is this trying to be transparent to solve the, to answer the questions that buyers typically have 
let me let me kind of and this influences the content I want to build for the website, the way in which I discover if we have the content even available. Uh, I find that there are four questions that buyers will pretty much ask all the time, even if they don't really ask them. It's it's what's underneath their thinking. And the first question, let's okay. right. So here's the first question. Latest. The first question they ask is, <laughs> gosh, there's so many technologies out there. Am I looking at the right category of technology to address my situation? There's a lot of technology now and there's a lot of overlap. And so the first thing you might ask is, you know, you're looking at cybersecurity perhaps, right? It's like, do I need this type of category or this kind of category? Do I already get some of what these guys are providing by what I already have? So you're trying to figure out what category. Um, if you're a, a marketing leader or a sales leader, there's something like 10,000 marketing solutions out there. Uh, it's just mind blowing. <laughs> it's like, so it's a legitimate question. They all tell us we're going to get yeah. more leads and be more efficient. Yeah, but so which category? Great. Second question we ask is, well, within this category, am I looking at the right vendors for me? Is this a contender vendor? So um, this is where Gartner Magic Quadrants and Forrester Wave Reports, if you're in, in technology spaces that they cover that way, can be very helpful to a buyer. Very helpful because they identify the characteristics of a category. They say, this is what it is, this is what it's not. Um, if you're looking for these things, that's in a different category over here, and so forth. And then here are some of the players who are in this category. And they, of course, all say, just because a company is at the top corner in our report, doesn't mean that, that they are the right company for you. Which brings us to the third question. By the way, I should say, oftentimes when we're shopping for something, we bounce around between question one and question two as we learn about a company. Oh, I didn't know that that category even exists. Yeah. Who else is in that category? So we kind of play a little, you know, kind of in our research. We go through back and forth. Yeah. Right. Take, the third question we ask is, gosh, okay. Yeah. Would I, the buyer, be successful implementing this technology their systems, their processes, their workflows, their integrations that are required with my systems, my people, my workflows, my integrations, what I've got going, right? So can I take this and integrate it well with mine? Would I be successful? Because I don't want to buy something that's too big. And, and we'll come back to, to this point sure. because it's rather important. And then the fourth question we ask is, is it worth it? <laughs> is it going to be worth the upheaval of changing processes, depending on, you know, taking something out, putting something in, maybe that's the kind of purchase or blending or, you know, training our people, onboarding, that, the whole onboarding, getting going and maintenance. And then the initial cost, is it going to, are we going to get an economic benefit? Can we measure it? How is it measured? How much will we get? When could we expect it? All the kind of financial types of value type of stuff a little bit. So, you say, okay, David, that makes sense. This is all very obvious. So how does this change your marketing? Well, if these are the questions that people are asking as they look at my website, I need to make it easy for them to find the answers to those questions. Because I know that 90% yeah, right. of the relationship I have with all of my prospects happens before they reveal themselves to me. I don't know who they are. They've come to my website using a browser that doesn't allow cookies. So they're just another web hit that came, but they're looking at my website, trying to get answers to these questions. So I want to make sure that I am presenting information. My third question, the buyer says, would I be successful implementing this, onboarding it, using it, integrating it, getting going, right? Okay. A lot of the answers to that question is often put inside of what we call sales enablement and is given to the prospect by a sales rep as they are part of the buying process, which is fine, except a lot of buyers want that information before they even reveal themselves. <laughs> so there's a, there's a gap. I have it available. The sales rep is ready to give it to you as soon as you register for a, a, a white paper and, and da, 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 and go into a sales opportunity, right? And I'm saying, let's take that information and expose it on the website in a way that's easy to find and easy to access mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that we're helping answer the question. Um, should we have pricing on our website becomes a question. Interesting. A lot of 
a lot of energy goes into how people feel about that. I would argue that you should show pricing or at least the dimensions of how pricing is calculated. We do pricing based on the volume of data that passes through our thing. Hmm. Broadly speaking, most of our customers pay between this much and this much. I haven't nailed down something, but I've given an indication. Perhaps that could be a way to, to square the circle. If you don't want to give away pricing because you're afraid of your competitors or underselling or something, but if giving some kind of indication is, is going to be helpful. And I'll, I'll go one step further. The quality of the experience that a prospect has as they are learning about you is a strategic differentiator among your competitors and yourself. So if I'm a prospect and I come to your website and it's really hard to get the information I want to answer my four questions or any other questions I might have, and I go to one of your competitors in the same category, on the magic quadrant maybe, and all of a sudden I can find the answers and it's much easier. Yeah. I'm leaning towards the other company that's made it easy for me. Now they, their product could be really bad. It may not work nearly as well. It might cost three times as much money and I get less value, but I don't know that yet. I'm just, yeah, you just see that's it. what, what so, is available. Yes. Yeah. Right? I, I do it the we're, same way. We're, because we're, we're in a hurry. We don't want to waste too much time. We're impatient. We could ask ourselves, why is all that happening in our world? That's a great, yeah, for a different podcast. Uh, but the quality of the experience that people have with your information, with your promotion, with your, it's, it's kind of the brand. We used to use the term brand. I'm trying to narrow it down into this notion of learning about me learning about this vendor, learning about their solution. If this experience is easy, fun, even fulfilling, I get what I need in that respect, then that is a strategic differentiator. So if two of your competitors give pricing and you don't, you're at a disadvantage, it seems to me. So <clears throat> yeah, t totally understandable. Yeah, I am um, it. Yeah. It's hard to find out the right way. Yeah, it can really take some time. It, if you see it, at, if you see a good example, uh, it right. looks like it. That's logical. Yeah, of course, makes sense. You should do it like that. This is it. But to get so to this the, point, these four it's, it's questions really are hard. very interesting yeah. because then I can do an information audit of the website, for example, because all of my serious prospects are going to come to my website. Mm -hmm. So I might classify the information that's available as that kind of helps answer question one, answer question two. Answer question three, like broadly speaking, try to categorize the content that I have. And I often discover that we don't have a lot of information on the website about question three. So I try to expose what might already exist. Yeah. Hey, you've already got it. Maybe there's a way to, to have something in the, in, in one of the menus mm -hmm. or on the homepage that says, here's what it takes to, you know, to succeed or something. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I, I think this is already <laughs> some great advice. I, I, I'm already very thankful to have you here as, as my interview partner. Um, maybe if you switch a little bit at, uh, when you're going towards the end, is there something you would like to highlight and, and mention that did not work recently in a specific case? Yes, he says careful, carefully, something I tried something to do right. Yeah. Something you would, yeah, and you you would like to it's share. It's always going to be harder to get anyone's attention if you haven't got some kind of differentiation that you can share, and then explain why the differentiation is helpful to the prospect. So a lot of us work with products that don't have adequate differentiation or the differentiation isn't being articulated in a clear mm -hmm. manner. So what hasn't worked is when I, when I'm in a situation where I'm using language that is a bit generic to the category where it sounds a lot like everyone else. So I'm keeping up with the Joneses, but the, as the expression goes in English, keeping up with the Joneses, right? But the Joneses aren't doing very good. <laughs> so I've, I've, I, you know, I'm keeping up, 
with not doing good, which isn't a good place. So what's not worked is when I'm doing any kind of activity that's paid where I'm not able to show how the differentiation brings impact. And the impact is, is the promise of what, we're, what you would get if you were to be our customer a little bit. So it's hard. Yeah, right. Maybe it's maybe especially hard in, in rising markets when there's something new, a new niche coming up and maybe you are one of the first. Yes, competitors. so interesting. That's a really, um, really yeah. great call. So our marketing needs to acknowledge many different contexts that we exist in. So if we are an unknown brand with an emerging category, an emerging classification of something that's done that hasn't been done before and isn't being hasn't isn't understood we have an awful lot of education to do and it's an opportunity through being educational yeah. informational inspirational right to help evangelize the category with a very tight icp because we can't boil the ocean because we obviously don't have a lot of money And we never know if we're going to get another funding round given today's climate. So there in that context, you have to educate yes. a lot. If you're a well-known brand marketing an emerging category, <clears throat> it's different. People know who you are, I, but they didn't know you were in this category. Right. So that's a different context. If you're an unknown brand trying to break into a very well-established category, again, that's a different problem. Everyone knows what the category is, but we've just never heard of you. And so you end up needing to right. answer all the four questions, but maybe the question about, well, are you a contender? Why are you a contender? I mean, I know all about relational databases, but I've never heard of your company before. Why, are, why would you maybe be a good one? Or should I just go with one of the, the, the relational database vendors I've heard from a thousand times before? So that's... A, Each of those different contexts shapes the communication challenge we have. And as a sales rep, we all know this as well, because let's link it to sales a little bit. If everyone's heard of my brand and you are already a customer of my brand, you might see an email from me, the company, and go like, okay, what's this? I'm already a customer of theirs. What's that about? Even though you're selling a different line or a different different from a different business unit or a different kind of technology and so forth. Yeah. So these contexts yeah. are important. And, and as I say, shape the information we want to communicate because you have a different question as a buyer about, well, you know, is this a fit and so forth. So back to what didn't work. What doesn't work is not having a tight ICP. If I, if I don't have a tight ICP, then I, no. then it's, it's hard to know who I'm trying to really make happy. It's, I, I don't know if I could, I, if I had a tight ICP, perhaps my examples could be more relevant to them. If I have case studies to share, I could. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's important to start with it from that, the beginning. That, I, exactly. I, I, I've really come to, in recent years, how do I put this? I've worked in many startups and not all of them succeed, unfortunately. And part of the problem is not knowing yeah. who your ICP really is and not having a certain kind of fit. So your idea is a good fit. Your engineering is working great. You've got an engineering fit, but your messaging is wrong because you think you've got certain benefits, but they're not the right benefits. And your message around value and the impact right. and the impact being made isn't coming through. So to me, I, I, ideal customer profile and product market fit go together very, very, um, very closely. And any time you change your ICP, you are by definition changing your product market fit. And, sometimes, and I, I've come to really appreciate how valuable that is. It sounds obvious, but we change our ICP all the time. <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds obvious, yeah, but it looks like it's not obvious for really a, a lot of companies, a lot of people. So it feels like we could do um, or should do a next podcast episode in the future as well, um, because uh, there there's so many nice insights. Question in, if you or, or maybe you've got so much experience and seen so many different comp companies, obviously, 
maybe you could highlight three lessons you learned and you would like to share with the audience. I think a few are, are already mentioned, or maybe they're already mentioned, but maybe just a um, summary or something. If you're joining a company, as an individual person, you like to know that you're going to make an impact. And the more senior you are in an organization, of course, the more potential you have to make a greater impact overall, generally, not, which is not to, to say that other people, every, everyone's work is important. But if you join a company that doesn't have product market fit, it's, it's like rowing against the tide. It's like running uphill. <laughs> So know yeah. what you're getting involved with. If you're joining a startup that doesn't have product market fit, I'm, I'm going to make a number, 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of startups fail mm -hmm. because they maybe don't establish product market fit because they run out of money before they can establish it. Many, many, many reasons, right? And let's not go into them. But if you're, if you're currently listening to this and you're, you're thinking about your next job, um, either joining another organization for one reason or another, investigate product market fit, investigate the four, four key ways that a product market fit is measured by the idea fit, by the engineering fit, it works, the idea is a good idea, the engineering actually delivers what it's supposed to deliver, that the messaging is clear and understood, and that the value impact is present, is really there. It's tough when you're interviewing to do that. So one thing I've learned is, unfortunately, I've joined companies where it's product market fit wasn't established. The, the exact same work done at another company where it is established, and all of a sudden it's like running downhill. <laughs> it's like you know, it's it's like rowing the boat, yeah. and you're going with the tide. Everything's faster. Everything's more fun. It's less energy. It's it's much easier. So product market fit is really, is it's just one Definitely. key thing. I don't have to. I can. I can. <sighs> Awesome advice. I think the audience or, or many listeners. Well, we all recognize it after the fact. So the question becomes, how do we measure it before we're in? Can right. we speak to customers? What? But if we're if yeah. we know we're looking for this, then maybe we can be we can become inspired and, and find ways to to kind of like poke at it, ask about it in the interview process, try and get confirmation. How do that? How does the company establish product market fit? How have you measured it? Hey, I'm just curious. Do you have product market fit? Oh, yes, we have product market fit. Oh, good. Huh. Great. How are you establishing that? How have you measured that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you can really be confident in, in calls like that or, or uh, yeah, evaluating the current situation of a company, especially when it comes to uh, it's, it, leader. Positions. Well, you know, we, sometimes you, you, there's, there's a you lot that throws to. on. The other thing I'd, I'd also recommend or, or is yeah. we're right now at a very major inflection point in the tech business as AI comes on and in some ways takes the last 30 years of technology companies and throws the cards in the air. Everything's going to be different. Everything's going to be, and, and we don't know quite exactly how it's going to be different. And so <clears throat> it's a very interesting time as AI becomes applied to every piece of technology in different ways, sometimes to help make it, sometimes to help explain it, sometimes to help provide support, sometimes in lots of different ways. It's going to change how companies buy technology, what's even offered. So AI is disruptive in the same way as the internet was disruptive. You know, the internet is like the wiring right. in the house and AI is like the light. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So many frequent changes. I'm wondering how, what, what are you going to yes. talk about in one year in right. maybe the exact same podcast? Probably. Well, it, it, you know, these, these are challenges that are eternal. Okay. How do we appeal to our customers? How do we provide impact, yeah. show impact? These are eternal. The mm -hmm. context changes. People working from home make certain things easier and certain things harder. And that was a different, we're in a different context. So we'll have different contexts. We'll have, you know, things going on. There'll always be something to talk about. We're people after all. Yeah. yeah, right. I think this is the perfect sentence to finalize the podcast. We are all people, by the way, quoting sure. or okay. a quote of David Kirkdorfer. So 
I think it, it was fun talking to you. Let's come to the end of this one. Hope we are going to talk again in, in future. So, all right, everyone, that brings us to the end of the episode of Sprig Revenue. I want to thank our guest, David Kirkdorfer, for joining us today, sharing such valuable insights. A huge shout out to all of our listeners. Your support means the world to us. Remember to check out our website at speakrevenue.com for a full transcript or additional resources. And if you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you go for your listening needs. It really helps to get to get the word out. Also, follow us on LinkedIn and Insta or YouTube. So we'll be back soon with another great guest. Until then, stay curious and keep listening. Mm-hmm.